Good morning, CCUC. I miss you guys. It is always a privilege for me to be able to stand before you. It's humbling to be included into your teaching rotation. I thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Let me pray, and then let's jump in. Father God, we invite you into this space or whatever space it is where somebody is sitting, whether it's in the worship center or whether it's at home. Father, we thank you that your spirit is our teacher who will convict us and encourage us and make much of Jesus. Father, I remind all of us that if I would say anything that is not of you, would it quickly be forgotten? But I know there is power, there is hope, there's clarity, conviction, and encouragement when I say your words after you. Because in Isaiah 55, we're reminded your words never return to you without you accomplishing your agenda in the hearts of people. And we trust that again in this moment. And then we remind ourselves what James says, that we are not merely hearers of your word, but we are doers of your word, putting your word into practice, Father. That is the fruit of our faith. Now let me give all of you a moment with our heads bowed, and may your prayer maybe be just simply this. Father God, what do you have for me in this moment? I don't want to miss your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me show you a map of where we are. Here's Pergamum. It's 110 miles north of Ephesus. That's a postal route that you see with all those key cities of the seven churches. And so when, when John sends the vision of Jesus' vision, he sends them, as we've already looked at, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and then next week we'll, or next month we'll look at Thyatira. And, Smyr- and, and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea will be the last one. But as we talk about Pergamum today, let me show you a picture of an artist's rendition of what it would have looked like. The Acropolis dominated the plain. It was a 1,000 feet up where kind of the administrative part of the city and a lot of the key temples were located. Pergamum started out as... The, the treasurer for Alexander the Great, and then it developed into a prosperous city. At one time, Pergamon was the capital of Asia Minor, this whole region here that we're talking about. It was one of the chief key cities, and it was constantly in competition with Ephesus and Smyrna that we've already talked about. It boasted one of the steepest theaters in the ancient world, if not the steepest theater. Let me show you a picture. 80 rows, 10,000 seats. It was built in the Hellenistic period. And one of the unique things, it had a movable stage. You can see at the bottom, if you have ever have the chance to visit, there are holes where they would be able to set up the stage in any number of different ways. Very unusual. It also had a library. Scholars tell us that it was the second largest library in the ancient world. The third largest library was in the city of Ephesus. The largest library was in Alexandria, Egypt. There became an issue, though. Alexandria, Egypt became jealous of the size of the growing library in Pergamum, so they withheld papyrus for them. Now, papyrus is what they were writing things on. That's where they would put their books together on papyruses. And they withheld that then from the city of Pergamum. So the city of Pergamum had to figure out another way that they were going to be able to record things. So what they did is they developed parchment. Parchment were animal skins that they would skin down very, very thinly, and they were able to write on them. And frankly, they found that they held much better. Let me show you a picture of the contrast between the two. And so now we call this a codex, and we have whole uh, books of the Bible, ancient books of the Bible written written down on something like a codex. Now, we're going to follow the same outline that we have followed already for the city of Ephesus and the city of Smyrna and the letters written to them. Let me put this up here on the screen. Here's what we see. We'll talk about Christ, what the church is commended for, what they're rebuked for, what they're exhorted to do, the warning if they don't, and then the promise. All right, here we go. Let's start with Christ. Revelation 2.12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. 
Now, we've already seen this. If you remember back in Revelation 1, we've already even talked about this, but let me draw your attention to it nonetheless. Revelation 1.16. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's what I think Jesus is doing. He's making a play on words for us because the people in the context would have understood what this meant. The Roman, the Roman governor of Asia indicated his powers that he carried a sword, a short sword. In fact, let me show you a, a statue of Trajan, and he has that short sword. It indicated his power, his power to, ability to give life, in his power or ability to take life as he brings judgment, the final judgment on someone's life. You see on that picture the Latin word for this. Now, we've already seen this before in the Bible. We've seen this with Jesus as he stood before Pilate. Pilate makes this same boast. In John 19.10, John, the gospel writer, the one who recorded the book of Revelation for us, writes, Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? He has the sword of power. But look how Jesus responds. Jesus answered, you'd have no power over me if it were not given to you from above, which again is a very key thing for us and for this church in the city of Pergamum. A reminder for us, a two-edged sword cuts two ways, obviously, a double-edged sword. It brings salvation, it brings protection, or it brings judgment and condemnation. Now, this was, frankly, to be an encouragement to the church there in Pergamum. The Roman government doesn't have power over your life. Whatever the Roman government is able to do, God has granted it to them, and eventually, Over eternity, God has complete control. He is the one who grants eternal life to those who believe in his son, Jesus Christ. All right, let's move on. Look with me at verse 13. Notice what Jesus commends the church for here. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Now, let's talk about Antipas first. There must have been a severe time of persecution where this man Antipas' life was taken. Church tradition, which is different from church history, church tradition is not as accurate as church history is, but church tradition says that he was either killed during the reign of Nero or Domitian, which we've already talked about. Those were the two most severe times of persecution of the early church. One says that he was boiled in a bronze bull that we talked about last time, and this would have been under the reign of Nero. And the reason that he was killed was because he was casting out demons that were popular in Pergamum. Now, according to church tradition, he was also the first bishop of Pergamum in that he was appointed by John, the gospel writer and the recorder of the Revelation. Now, to understand where this phrase, where Satan has his throne, comes from, we need to understand a little bit of the context of the city and what was true of this particular city. We've talked about this a little bit before, but this is where it begins, this idea of emperor worship. Neocoros, Neocoros was a city that hosted a temple to an emperor. Very few cities had this honor. We know that Smyrna had it, and we know that Ephesus had it, but Pergamum had it first. This was granted by the Roman Senate and by the Roman emperor to certain cities that would then build a temple to honor a particular emperor or the imperial family. This imperial cult was first seen and supported in the city of Pergamum. The worship of the emperor became, frankly, a test of loyalty that once a year that every citizen in the city of Pergamum, for instance, needed to proclaim, Caesar is Lord. And this is where the struggle came in for followers of Christ. Part of the baptismal liturgy would have been that Christians would have said, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord and Lord of 
alone. There is no competition. Well, this would put them into conflict with this whole imperial cult. In fact, the language used for the imperial cult sounds very Bible-ish. The the emperor was called Savior, Lord, Master, Son of Man, God. Many times the emperors would use emperor worship to solidify uh, the support of a particular region around himself. And Pergamum was a hub of imperial cult worship in the providence of Asia Minor for a number of years. It first started in 29 BC with Augustus when he authorized the temple to the goddess Roma. Now, Roma was a female deity who personified the city of Rome and more broadly the Roman state. And this would have given Pergamum just great civic pride, the first temple in Asia Minor to the imperial cult. Now, we don't know where this temple is. It has yet to be found, but we know that it existed because we have found coins with the picture of the temple on it. Let me show you. We'll put it up here on the screen. Now, what's interesting within the context of the book of Revelation, that it is thought that the Temple of Roma and Augustus in Pergama is a manifestation of the cult of the beast and its image written about by John in the Revelation. Now, there's a couple other things. The Temple of Athena. The Temple of Athena, which was built in 525 B.C., was written to worship Athena, who was the daughter of Zeus. She was called the protector of the city, the goddess of wisdom and victory. She was considered one of the most important gods. And Athena was so closely connected to the god Nike, like the shoes, Nike, the goddess of victory, that the two were considered one and the same. In fact, many times you will see Athena written as Athena of victory. The people worshipped the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, at this Athena temple. And it was connected very closely with the altar of Zeus. Now, let me show you a picture of the altar of Zeus. Again, what an artist's rendition based on the archaeological finds thinks it looks like. Now, here's another picture up close of what the altar itself would have looked like and where it would have been in the city of Pergamum. You see, now there is just a tree there because this altar had been taken to the city of Berlin. Let me show you what it looks like today. I've had the privilege to go to this museum and be able to see this altar to Zeus. It is huge. You can see the scope of it with the people on the stairs. One church tradition says that Antipas was killed right here because he wouldn't offer a sacrifice to Zeus. Now, meat sacrificed idols. We've talked about it a little bit. We'll talk about it again next month as we talk about the city of Thyatira. But what would happen is that you would see this altar of Zeus that smoke would rise from it all day long as sacrifices were brought all day long. Now, they would bring a piece of the meat. And what would they do with the rest of the meat? Well, the the meat had been sacrificed or had been dedicated to Zeus. Part of it burnt. The rest of it taken down to the meat market in the city of Pergamum down below. Well, Christians had trouble eating this meat because many believed in the early couple of decades of this time period is that, that there were demons now attached to the meat and they would not eat this meat. Now, there are other meat places, there are other butchers that they could go to, especially Jewish butchers, which would make it far more expensive, but it also put them on the social outs with people. Now, that phrase, where Satan has his throne, let me give you two broad views. One is this altar itself, that Zeus's altar looks like the arms of a throne, and you can see that. Identifying the chief god Zeus then was identified as Satan, the chief of the demons, who would be a natural extension of the thought of the demons and the power of the demons that Zeus is the head of all of this. Zeus, who was the chief, the king of all gods. 
This particular altar set Pergamum apart from the other six cities of the book of Revelation, of the letters to the church of the book of Revelation, because of the uniqueness of it and what it stood for. But a second view said, no, it's not the altar of Zeus. It's frankly this whole thing. It's this whole political system. That is the throne. That's where Satan has his throne. This whole political system up here, up high, where the administrative offices are and these, and these various temples are. The amazing thing is that with all that is going on, with all the persecution that they're receiving, with all the emperor worship taking place, that there is a group of followers of Jesus who are being truly faithful in their faith in the midst of all this. All right, let's look at the next one, rebuke. He rebukes them. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, Jesus says. Now look at that first phrase, you have people there. The problem, what's the problem? False teachers, we're going to see. False teachers, you have people there. Now, the reason it's a rebuke that we're going to see is that the church is allowing these false teachers to exist. They're not addressing the issues of false teachers. Do you remember in the city of Ephesus that the Ephesians addressed the false teachers? They were so diligent to the part, part, they were so diligent to the point that they began to lose their love for Jesus. They were so focused on rooting out the false teachers. What happened here? that the church began to give up in addressing these false teachers? Well, frankly, we really don't know. We don't know. They maybe just got weary. Now, what was the false teaching? Look with me again back at verse 14. Who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Now, this whole story can be found in Numbers. In fact, in Numbers 31, 16, let me read this for us. There were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and were the means of turning the Israelites away from the Lord and what happened at Peor so that the plague struck the Lord's people. Now, Balak was the king of the Moabites. And the people of Israel had come into the valley. Let me show you a picture of the valley. And they are numerous. And Balak wants them to be cursed because he wants them gone. And so he goes to Balaam, who is a prophet for hire. In fact, Balaam, all through the New Testament, whenever Balaam is mentioned, he's portrayed as a prototypical false prophet. But every time Balaam goes up on a mountain to curse the children of Israel, God says to him, Don't curse them, bless them. Don't curse them, but bless them. And this went on several times. But Balaam still wanted the money that was being offered by the king. And so he said, listen, I can't curse them. I can only bless them because that was what God has said. But let me give you a strategy in how you can disrupt them, how you can get uh, get their God angry at them. And he said, listen, invite them to your feast where you eat meat sacrificed to to your gods. Have your women sleep with their men. And sure enough, that created havoc between God and his people to the point that God brought the sword of judgment on the people. Look with me at verse 15. There's the second false teacher that is in their midst. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans. Now, there's two views who these folks are. One is that the Nicolaitans come from a guy of Nicholas from Antioch that is mentioned in Acts 6. A 7th century writer describes this Nicholas dude as someone who left his faith and began to sin gratefully, and began to draw a a group of people that began to follow his false teaching. That's the only thing we see about him. I'm not sure if that's completely accurate or not, but that's part of church tradition. There's others who say, no, these Nicolaitans are is based not on an individual, but based on the meaning of the name. It's a compound word. Nico means victory in Greek. 
And laos means people, or more specifically, the laity. So they take the word to mean lay conquerors. It seems like that these false teachers were advocating, accommodating to to pagan society by eating meat sacrificed to idols and engaging in sexual immorality. Gnosticism was just being introduced in the early church around this time. And Gnosticism said, it's not your physical being. That's not what matters. It's your soul. In fact, Gnosticism is based on the idea of knowledge. You gain knowledge and kind of maneuver yourself toward God. And so who cares what happens in your physical body? You can do whatever you want. Eat meat sacrificed to idols. What's the big deal? Sleep with, prince, uh, with temple prostitutes. What's the big deal? Now, what's interesting, if I can just draw this comparison, Balaam's name in Hebrew, when you break down the compound word of Balaam's name, Bala, which means to conquer, and Ham, which means people. So Nicholas and Balaam then would be the Greek and Hebrew forms of the same name. So could it be that Balaam and the Nicolaitans are the same group of false teachers teaching the same thing to accommodate? What's the big deal? One sense of being, it will lessen the pressure on us if we accommodate. But we'll talk more about that next month when we talk about Thyatira. The bottom line is there's false teachers and the church is not addressing the issue. All right, let's move on. Look at verse 16. Two words in the exhortation that Jesus gives to the church. Repent, therefore. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Repent, therefore. Repent is used 12 times in the book of Revelation. Why? Because it says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Jesus is confronting the church, and he's calling them to repent. Jesus is telling the church, you need to repent from not dealing with the false teachers. Notice he doesn't call the false teachers to repent. He calls the church to repent. Repent, therefore. Deal with these false teachers. Repentance, though, is a very hopeful word for us as followers of Christ. It's our way out, so to speak. Repentance is something the Spirit convicts us to do, empowers us to be able to do. It is something we're invited to do. But here's the issue. Then it's the choice of our will. The Spirit's convicting us. The Spirit will empower us. The choice is, will we be obedient and repent? Repentance, turning from this behavior, from these thoughts, and turning to Jesus in our worship of of Jesus. He goes on then and, and talks about the warning. Look what he says in the warning in verse 16. If you don't repent, otherwise I will soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now he's going to come and he's going to fight the false teachers. This will not be a fair fight. This will not end pretty. This will be one-sided. Jesus is not going to lose. And what's his weapon of choice? The sword, a double-edged sword. Now, what is the sword that comes out of his mouth? It's the word of God. It's truth. It's the word that condemns, but it's also the word that saves. It's the word that judges, but it's also the word that lifts up. Jesus' word condemns the wicked and assigns them to a second death, we're told, in Revelation 20, verse 14. All right, let's look at the last section, promise, verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And all seven record that same phrase. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. To him who overcomes. Overcoming, as we've already talked about, is a theme all through the book of Revelation. Nikeo, to be victorious, to push through, to push through the suffering and the persecution, to stay faithful. 
And remember, we talked about these promises that are always connected to the end of the book of Revelation. So in Revelation 21, 6, it says, Jesus said to John, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. He who overcomes will inherit all this. Now, what will those who overcome in the church of Pergamum also receive? There are three things. One, manna. Now, manna was God's provision to the Hebrews, to the Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. Every morning they went out and gathered this thing called manna. Manna literally means, what is this? But it was God's provision for them. And so what Jesus is saying to the church, if you say no to eating meat sacrificed to idols, if you say no to false worship, if you say no, I will provide you with manna. I will take care of you. I will provide for your very needs. In fact, we're reminded in Revelation 19 that a banquet is coming where the bride, us, the church, is gathered to the groom, Jesus, at a banquet at a celebration of of our marriage to him for eternity. And the coolest thing about this banquet is you can eat all you want and not get fat. I'm in. Jesus will provide for us. He points forward and says, I'll provide for you now, but I will provide for you in your eternity. A white stone. A white stone in this culture had several different meanings, but let me just give you two that I think that fit within our context. A white stone was given to everyone who was on a jury at a trial. And at the end, you would even vote with a black stone or a white stone. The black stone was guilty. The white stone was innocent. The white stone is a reminder to the children of God that because of Jesus, they stand before They stand before God innocent because of Christ. But it was also used by those who competed in the Olympics or the Olympic-type games that were in every region around this area, that when you won, you got a white stone with your name written on it. And what this would be is this would be the entrance for you into a banquet where you were celebrated because of your victory. And so this is given to us as a reminder that the banquet is coming. Again, Revelation 19, the wedding feast is coming. The new name. It says the one who is found not guilty is given a new name. Now, again, this is not completely clear, but we do know in the book of Isaiah, we're told we get a new name. In Revelation 19, 12, we're told that Jesus has a name that no one knows but himself. Regardless, the new name is part of our new identity. We have been sought. We have been forgiven. We have been received. We have been adopted. We have been given a full inheritance. We are sons and daughters of God. We are brothers and sisters of Jesus with a new name, a new identity. All right, let me sum this up for us. False teachers, we've talked about it before, but let's go back and look at it a little deeper now. The church in Ephesus doggedly dealt with false teachers to the point that they forgot their love for Jesus in the midst of the battle. The problem was possibly the other extreme with the church in Pergamum. Ephesus was so focused on truth, they lacked love. And Pergam possibly was so focused on love and tolerance that they have easily lacked truth. It's not one over the other, it's both and. We need both truth and love in dealing with false teachers. Now, what is false teaching? False teaching is teaching something contrary to the Bible. It can be done accidentally, A mistake is made in understanding a passage or not understanding a passage in light of all of Scripture. It can be an overemphasis. We overemphasize something in the Bible. Usually it's done around something that is supernatural. Not always, but many times. Around speaking in tongues or miracles or things like that. Or it can be an overemphasis on authority. 
the leader having full and final authority, usually because they believe they have some divine authority that has been given to them. Cults are created out of this kind of false teaching. False teaching many times is very human-centered. It is a theology that prophesies us one way or another. If I do this, then I should get this. This is what the prosperity gospel is at its core. The name and enclaimment theology that comes out of the prosperity gospel, simply put, it is claiming something you want or you think that you should have as a Christian in the name of Jesus. You deserve this, the thinking goes, and Jesus wants to give it to you, whether it be health or wealth or whatever. Or false teaching can be not calling something sin that the Bible calls sin, like the context we have here in Pergamum. It's okay what the Bible denounces, sexual immorality, like in this passage, like you see in so many cults. False teaching takes place when the church will not act. False teaching will take place when the church, the community of faithful believers, will not act. What happens is sometimes we'll just go, well, you know, that's not the way I think. That's just a different way of thinking, but I'm not going to confront them. We need to be loving and accepting. It might not be the way that I would explain it, but I don't want to be judgmental about this person. It's our lack of acting only encourages the false teacher, though, to continue, and many times to be bolder in their teaching Because they'll go, well, no one's talked to me about it. No one's addressing this with me. Maybe it's out of ignorance. We just don't know enough to push back. We think something's not right, but who are we to say? I mean, I'm just not sure. It takes the church to protect the church. It takes spirit-filled followers of Jesus to protect the church. It takes spirit-filled followers of Jesus to address false teaching based on the Bible. It takes the sword. The Bible is called a sword several times throughout the New Testament. In Ephesians 6, 17, we'll put it up here on the screen. In Hebrews 4, 12, it talks about the word being the sword. The sword can be an offensive weapon. It's used to strike. It's aggressive. This is the way Jesus intends to use it in the passage, to be aggressive with it, to address the false teaching. Each of us can evaluate a message based on the Bible, and we should. We should ask questions. We should be willing to have the hard conversations. All of us sit with our Bible open, listening to whoever teaches, taking what he says and comparing it to what the Word says. Isn't that exactly what the Bereans do in Acts 17.11? When Paul comes to the city of Berea, look at Acts 17.11. Now the Bereans were more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness Now, here it is. And examine the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They're checking Paul out, the Apostle Paul. Goodness. And you know what? Paul was grateful for it. He was glad that these Bereans were taking the Scripture and listening to his teachings and making the comparison is what Paul's saying coming out of here. But we should do this with grace and patience, being mindful that we may be wrong. We're not on a witch hunt. There are those among us who have the gift of discernment. It is a spirit-led gift that God uses to discern things that are right or wrong, especially in teaching. My wife has this gift. Some of you listening to this have this same gift. You hear something or read something and your discernment meter goes off and you go, this is not right. Many times you discern that something is missing in what is being said. You need to speak up. God's using you to protect the church. 
but it needs to be more than just a feeling. Charging someone with false teaching is a very serious offense. The church in Pergamum is called to repent for not addressing false teachers. May that not be something that we hear as a church. Repent because you won't address false teachers. Now, one last word on this. May we be as quick to encourage those who teach us as we are to be critical of them. May we pray for them. May we support them. Because what they do is no easy task. These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Remember, the Roman governor carried the sword, an indication of his power to give life or to take life. And Jesus is saying, no, he has the final authority. He wields the sword of eternal life and condemnation. It is the sword of judgment. In Revelation 19.11, it says, I saw the heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, the sword of judgment. But it's also the sword of life. Jesus' sword judges, but it saves. It condemns, but it brings life. It strikes down, but it also protects We all at one time stood under the sword of judgment of Jesus, judged and condemned, to be struck down as an enemy of Jesus. For we have lived in resistance to God, ignoring his call on our life, choosing to live as we wished instead of how he designed us to live. We stood as one condemned. Jesus has pulled his sword to rightfully judge us. But there is hope for the judged. God takes the sword of Jesus and it falls on Jesus. Jesus stands condemned and is judged in our place for our sin. The sword of judgment falls upon Jesus on the cross so that we may know his sword of life and protection on our behalf. I love the city of London. I love its diversity. I love its history. There's two unique buildings among many unique buildings in the city of London. One's called Old Bailey, and it's the criminal court for England and Wales. And on the top of Old Bailey stands the statue of of Justice, Lady Justice. What's interesting is she's not blindfolded to communicate. She sees clearly and makes judgments accurately. But another significant building in the city of London is the Church of St. Paul. And on top of St. Paul, what you see is that you see a cross. On top of Old Bailey, you see Lady Justice with the sword of righteousness in her hand. But on top of St. Paul's, you see a cross. One day, Don and I were walking through London. We had just left St. Paul's, and we were walking away. And we came to a place where we could stop, and it was interesting. We could see Old Bailey in one direction, and we could see St. Paul in another. We could see the sword of righteousness on Old Bailey, but we could see the cross on top of St. Paul. As followers of Christ, we stand under both the sword of judgment and condemnation under Jesus' righteous reign, but also the protection of his sword that he gives to those that are his children, that are his brothers and sisters because of the cross and the work that he has done on the cross. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you We thank you for these letters to the churches, for we read ourselves in these letters. We see how these letters still speak to us today. May we remind ourselves that as a church, we are called to be protectors of your truth within our community of faith. Not to be on a witch hunt, but to be discerning, to listen, to make sure that what is being said can be found in the Word. 
the sword of truth be applied to all of us. And we thank you that, Father, there was a time when we stood under the sword of judgment, of Jesus' judgment, his righteous judgment. But because of the cross, we now stand under his protection. The sword is used to protect us and to bring us life. We praise you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.